thank you everybody for coming this evening uh, to another Hardman uh, Investor Forum. For those who don't know me, my name is Keith Hiscock. Uh, I'm the Chief Executive of Hardman & Co. Tonight, as is normal, we've got four companies presenting um, and the format allows for a 15-minute presentation followed by 10 minutes of questions. Obviously, there's an opportunity uh, after the uh, formal part of the evening to uh, meet with the companies uh, and network over some drinks and canapes. You'll find in your, uh, in your packs, there's a note on each of the companies with the exception of, uh, of Open Orphan, uh, a copy of their presentation, most importantly a feedback survey which we'd like you to complete and give your views on how the presentations have gone. Now this is a great welcome back because I think that um, when we held our first forum of this sort back in 2014, Harry was amongst the first four speakers. <laughs> Um, now, PHP, Primary Health Properties, for those who don't know, uh, is a business that um, gives you and inve the investor the chance to buy into primary health properties, i.e. GP surgeries, uh, effectively all let to the NHS uh, or its Irish equivalent. Um, uh, thus, the shares have, to, to a great extent, got gilt-like characteristics with a rather higher yield than you could get on gilts. Um, it's been a very big year for PHP. They bought or merged with uh, their, one of their biggest rivals, the quoted company called, uh, called Medix. And it means that in total, um, the business has got a portfolio of nearly two and a half billion. In fact, they made one acquisition in the last couple of days to, uh, to add to that. So we're very fortunate today to have the founder uh, and managing director, Harry Hyman, uh, along with uh, Richard Howells, the finance director, and Chris Santa is the CIO. Harry, over to you. Thanks, Keith, and it's a great pleasure to be here. As Keith said, it's been a very um, important year for us and a very busy year. And what I'm going to do before Richard takes over and deals with the financials and Chris talks a bit more about the property aspects is just give you an overview of PHP. And as Keith said, what PHP does is a very, very simple business model. We buy medical centers. They used to be called GP surgeries, but they're now much larger animals. The average lot size in our portfolio is just shy of £5 million ago. And we, we, we own them on a long-term basis, structured as a real estate investment trust, which is a tax-neutral, tax-transparent tax structure, and pay out the net revenue after our management costs and interest charges to investors. And I'm pleased to say in the 23, 24 years we've been operating, we've grown our dividend in every single one of the years. Following our agreed merger with Medix, which completed in March, we have a property portfolio of just shy of 2.5 billion, and our share price has performed very well and is now a total market capitalization of 1.7 billion. But you can still get a yield of something like 3.9% by investing in our shares. 90% uh, of the total rent roll of PHP comes from either the British or the Irish governments, all major political parties in Ireland and in Britain, importantly, have a strong, unwavering commitment to the health service. And what drives our business is demographics, not politics. So both in Britain and Ireland, we have a growing population. We have an aging population, and we have a population that has got a larger incidence of chronic disease as we all grow older, and many of us, myself included, being overweight, leading to type 2 diabetes and things like that. This puts a massive strain on the health systems in both countries. And one of the ways of dealing with that economically is to move more of the care out of expensive, inflexible hospitals into new primary care infrastructure. So what we are effectively is healthcare infrastructure. We have a strong capital base. We recently raised £100 million, reducing our leverage after that to 44%, which was the same level as it was before we bid for medics. We have begun to deliver uh, substantially on some of the benefits of the medics merger, which have included scale. So we're now in the top half of the FTSE 250. Share liquidity has shown great signs of improvement. We've delivered on the 4 million of cost savings that we talked about in the merger document, um, and those are all in place. And importantly, we've also begun to deliver, as you'll hear later on, on some of the financing cost savings that will come as 
bigger companies can borrow at lower rates of finance. And we've done that. It's been a very, very active year for us. And importantly, we are beginning to see nascent signs, the green shoots of recovery, in the level of rental growth that we uh, have achieved. And that's very important for driving future dividend growth. I'm not allowed to talk about that right now, but you'll understand pretty simply that if our costs of finance go down and our rental income growth goes up, there will be more available surplus to be distributed. And obviously when we announce our results um, in February, we'll be saying a bit more about that. I think I've covered off a lot of the points about the, um, about the merger already. Let me just check which ones I, I need to draw your attention to. Um, we now have the largest portfolio of primary care. Um, we have one quoted competitor, Assurer, but we have a different approach to buying property. First of all, we're in Ireland, which gives us the opportunity of adding uh, more profitable deals. We have a different approach to buying assets. We're much more selective. We want the large hub core medical centres that are redundancy proof looking to the future, and we don't develop because we consider that to be <coughs> too risky. Every deal that we buy is earnings accretive, very important for driving that future uh, dividend growth. Um, Richard and Chris will talk a bit more about that later in the presentation. We have a strong track record, which you can see from this slide. I'm very proud of this. I founded the business as a quoted company in 1996. We've had a four for one share split somewhere along the way, but you'll have had something like an 11% compound annual return as a shareholder during that period, of which currently just under 4% comes in dividend. Given that 90% of the income comes from the British or Irish governments, as we know, there's a massive commitment to the NHS in this country. This is as close as you get to guaranteed income. We have a strong track record of renewing the leases. Primary care is growing in importance, so we're in a fantastic sector. I'm now going to hand over to Richard, who's going to take you through more of the financial side. At one point you did miss the Harry's. Um, we've now got the lowest EPRA cost ratio in the whole of the UK REIT sector, which is something we're very proud of. Um, perhaps looking at some of the relative performance of PHP shares uh, since it was founded. So if you'd bought a PHP share back in 1996, it would have cost you 25p. Uh, close of business today, that is shares valued at just under 145p and you would have received a thick end of 83p in dividends over that period. So that has delivered an internal rate of return of just over 13% for shareholders. Uh, and as you can see from this uh, bottom left-hand chart, the returns we've delivered for shareholders have been very consistently double-digit numbers. So you go back to 20 years, 14.5% compound annual growth rate. Last year, we've driven, delivered 36%, which really reflects the benefits of the merger with medics. We've outperformed Assure over pretty much every time scale you look at and massively outperformed the EPRA UK REIT index. Looking at the absolute returns over one, three and five years, you can see that PHP has outperformed uh, not only the FTSE All Share Index, but also the FTSE All Share REIT Index. So, you know, over five years you've received a return of just under 107%. Um, MSCI UK Monthly Property Index, this is a sort of an industry standard index tracking performance of property. Again, pretty much over every time horizon, we have outperformed the sector. Um, as Harry's already mentioned, um, you know, we're looking to expand, keep delivering this earnings growth, um, and we raised 100 million of equity in September this year. That was predominantly to finance a very active pipeline we have um, of £150 million, pounds, of which £16 million is in forward-funded developments currently on site, and a further £70 million pounds is in legals, which we hope to announce very shortly. Now, Chris will come on and talk about the portfolio in a minute, but the majority of this pipeline, around two-thirds, is in Ireland, where there are very um, interesting characteristics and much more earnings accretive to um, PHP. We also have um, a small amount of money to invest in our existing assets, predominantly to re-gear leases. But again, most of these assets, as Chris will demonstrate, are quite simple buildings and they don't take a lot of uh, money to look after. In, in return, you generally get brand new 20, 25-year leases over the whole of that asset. 
So I'm going to hand you over to Chris now, who will take you through the uh, property portfolio. Great. Thank you, Richard. I uh, hope you can hear me OK. So there's uh, a lot of numbers on this slide, but uh, a couple of key things to point out. So this is a, just a summary of our property portfolio. In the middle, PHP, as we were prior to the merger earlier this year uh, in March 2019. And then this is the Medics Fund, which we'd merged with earlier this year. So it really just gives you an idea of the increase in scale. It's another 50% again in terms of the size of the portfolio. So now we have 485 buildings uh, across the country. We have 15 in Ireland with a total portfolio capital value of our buildings of 2.4 billion, which are valued every six months by external valuers. We've got the best part of six and a half million square feet of uh, medical accommodation in there. A couple of other couple quick points I will make. is The average size of our building is five million pounds. So we have a large number of buildings in the portfolio, but the average size of our building is five million pounds. And the reason why I want to make that point is down here, we give a chart of the spread of the capital values of our portfolio. And it's these parts of the, uh, of the sector which we think are at risk. The smaller buildings, which is where you have your traditional old GP's uh, surgery, we think are the parts that are at risk from the changes going forward in terms of the NHS. So we have a very small exposure to them in the portfolio and a much larger exposure to the larger buildings where more and more things can be done in the primary care setting. The portfolio has an average lease length, so the contract, the revenues to the company have an average contract length of 13 years, uh, spread between, uh, spread over, I'll give you an example of the spread in a minute, but it's an average of 13 years. 99.5% of the portfolio is occupied, and 90% of the revenue to the portfolio is either directly or indirectly backed by the UK or Irish governments. This is where we are all across the UK, not Northern Ireland, but in Southern Ireland, Ireland. Uh, but we're across the country, we are, uh, we are, we are where the need is. Uh, so we're in London and the South East with a significant representation as well, across the Midlands and the North of England. Uh, and you can see here the, where we're not uh, let to GPs or for a pharmacy use, uh, where we're not let to GPs, it is a pharmacy use. Uh, so uh, pharmacies in a medical centre should be a pretty robust business. I'm going to flick through a couple of these because I'm conscious of the time. As I mentioned, we have 13 years average contract length, average lease length, uh, where the rents are set. But during that period of time, we are able to increase the rents as well. So about a third of the portfolio is uh, either has a fixed uplift that's already written into the contract or has an uplift on an annual basis that is linked to inflation, whether that's CPI or RPI, whether that's UK or Irish. And then about two thirds of the portfolio is uh, we have a rent review process. Every three years, the rent is reviewed. It is a process with the doctors and the NHS and the district valuer. And that enables us to go through the portfolio and grow that, and grow that rent as very loosely linked or indirectly linked to building costs and the replacement costs of the building. So as construction costs and as the costs of putting these buildings there increases over time, our uh, rental revenue can track that. Uh, track that over time as well. Again, just conscious of uh, time here, so I just wanted to give you uh, an idea of what some of our buildings look like. This uh, perhaps doesn't show up so well on, on, on the projector. Is a medical centre in Kew in uh, West London. Actually, that's not the whole medical centre. That is flats above, but this is something that we do quite frequently in London, is we can buy the ground floor of a development. It's a very good place for uh, a medical centre for the doctors to open a new surgery. This is actually three surgeries that have come together out of old dated premises uh, and relocated into this building. And there's a lot of new residential development going on around it. This is an example of one of our typical medical centres in Ireland. This is Bray to the south of Dublin, an affluent commuter town. Something's gone a little wrong with our formatting there, but it's a, uh, a large building with multiple uses. So there's GPs, but there is an urgent treatment centre in there. There is x-rays, physios, dentistry. So these are really healthcare hubs for the local community. We don't do development ourselves, I should make that point, but we fund developers. So for us, that is a good way to get access to new buildings without taking development risk. The developers will take the development risk. We buy new buildings. This is a property which we recently bought in Leeds, uh, and uh, which was actually a sale and lease back with the doctors who built the building. Uh, and this is another property we recently acquired in 
Dublin. And these are some of the typical buildings in the portfolio. And another way in which we grow the revenue in the portfolio is that as the leases come towards the end of their natural life, uh, we work with the occupiers who are often very keen to stay in these buildings. We refurbish the buildings, invest new money into them, and in return, we will get uh, an increased rental and a new contract with the, uh, with the occupiers. And that continues to be a good long-term asset for the, uh, for the portfolio. So that is a very quick whistle-stop tour of, uh, of our property portfolio. Thanks, Chris. Um, perhaps just going back, um, one point which I mentioned earlier is that most of our expansion at the moment, around two-thirds of the pipeline is in Ireland. And there's some very attractive characteristics there. And just to highlight some of these with a simple illustration. So, um, oops. Um, a typical, these are two acquisitions, one in the UK, one in Ireland. The average yield on a UK acquisition is around 4.8%. We knock off the external management fee. The cost of finance, we get a drop down to the bottom line of around 2%. This all assumes 100% debt finance. It's just for illustrative purposes, but obviously we do use equity. In Ireland, We've got a much better net of shield, 5.6%. Same um, management fee, but a much cheaper cost of debt because we're financing in euros, where 10-year um, euro swap rates are pretty much zero at the moment. And we get a drop, drop down to the bottom line of 3.7%. So almost double the rate we're getting in the UK. And as Chris has shown in the previous pictures, these are for buildings that are much bigger than the UK and brand new 25-year leases let to the Irish government. Um, just coming back to the liability side of the balance sheet, obviously we have a rock-solid um, income stream. and We like to apply leverage to that to drive returns for shareholders. Um, we have total debt facilities of around 1.4 billion, of which about 1.1 billion is drawn at the moment. So we have over 300 million pounds of firepower to deliver that pipeline. 93% of our facilities are fixed or completely hedged out, so we have very little risk to um, future interest rate rises, not that we're expecting any at the moment. The um, equity raise, which we completed in September, has reduced our leverage from the 48% that we've got up there down to 44% today. And our average cost of debt, now this is the key, key for us following the merger, that we're on track to deliver some significant cost-saving synergies in our cost of finance. So we've already reduced it from 4% when we merged back in March down to 3.68%. And we are about to deliver some further refinancings in the, before the end of the year, which should hopefully bring that down even lower. Um, and those really reflect the, the benefits of scale from the merger. The long average maturity, seven and a half years. And one example of what we can actually achieve in the market now. So in September, we raised a 70 million euro denominated private placement loan note fixed for 12 years all in at 1.5%. Um, very attractive debt compared to um, you know, properties we're buying yielding 5.6%. Looking at the debt maturity profile, as you can see, we don't have any huge maturity in any one year. Um, we are working very hard with all these facilities in 2020 to 22 to reduce, um, to refinance these, but also reduce the margins. And we expect to see um, margin savings around 25, 35 basis points. So I'm going to hand you back to Harry, who's just going to finish off. Um. So what PHP is all about for our investors, which includes the management team, um, for my, my family and I, we've still got just under 1% of the company. Uh, so it's a very meaningful investment for me is, and my family, is um, dividend growth. There you are. That's our chart. We're very proud of that. Unbroken uh, dividend growth for 23, 24 years. In America, I think they call them dividend aristocrats, and that's what we aim to be. Given the high quality of the income coming from UK government through the National Health Service and the Irish HSE, we think this is a brilliant uh, investment. I've already alluded to the fact that um, we might expect in the future uh, dividend growth to be somewhat faster than it's been over the last few years because of the reduced interest cost and greater prospects of rental growth, but you'll have to wait and see what we actually uh, come out with when we announce our results in February of next year. So that's our presentation, whistle stop. There's lots and lots of collateral on our website, including videos, 
of some of the buildings, lots of the buildings. Very happy to open the floor to questions. Now, I've got before you, could you, if you want to ask a question, let us know, and we've got roving mics that will come to you. Any questions? Ah. Hi there. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, could you just give us a few words, please, on the role of the district valuer uh -huh. in the UK and the drivers that they respond to? Sure. And also the equivalent, if there is an equivalent, within the Irish Republic and okay. how well, they in, may differ. Sure. Thank you for that question. I hope everyone heard it. Um, in Ireland, all of our leases are linked to Irish CPI, which is currently running at 1.92%, and the Irish government sets the initial rent. They're typically 20 euros a foot, uh, is the sort of, well, 18 to 24 is the bid offer spread, if you like, and we get an extra 5 euros a foot to discharge the maintenance obligations on the building, all index linked. In Britain, the principal driver. Um, the District Valuer is an executive agency of that wonderful organisation, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which we all know and love. So they're not sometimes the most generous people in the world. We think that's actually quite a good thing because it avoids anyone criticising us as ripping off the state because the rents are set in negotiation with us and our advisors by the HMRC through the District Valuer's office. And I think the principal driver, in my view, over time is index replacement cost. Uh, as the price of new buildings goes up, so they accept that the rent will have to keep pace with inflation. It doesn't say that in the rules. It says an open market value. But it, if you ask any of the operators in the space, they will say that it reflects index replacement cost. And when medics were still independent, Assura would all, would all agree that the, the trend in rental growth is on the up. Not a tsunami of rental growth, but better than it's been for the last three to four years, reflecting the fact that rents do have to go up if they want new medical centres built, because the developer has to make some sort of return, and the DV's office accepts that. Right, next question, please. Can you explain how the management fee works? I see that on one of yep. the slides there was a set percentage. But yes. Perhaps you could just talk a bit about how that yep. it's, works. It, it's, a it's a reducing banded percentage of gross assets, uh, which reflects the fact we've been in operation for 23, 24 years. The current marginal cost is 27.5 basis points, and it goes down gradually to a final stop of 20 basis points. Um, there are separate arrangements for the medics portfolio that we acquired, but the total expense ratio is point. 5.5, five, uh, which compares quite favourably with, with other uh, externally managed vehicles. And as Richard said earlier, the bit I forgot at the beginning, is that we have the, lower, the lowest EPRA cost ratio of any quoted property company. And research by Peel Hunt, if you look at that, it has a chart of that, and that is a fact that's been externally verified. So it's, it obviously comes down to reflect the fact that the marginal cost of, of managing the properties does in fact come down. And to be completely transparent, there is a performance incentive fee as well, which incentivizes us to produce a total return of at least 8% um, each year. Right. You mentioned your competitor was Assura. Yeah. What about the institutions? Because it looks like they're a cup of tea to me. Well, the lot size at 5 million is too small for many of them. Where we look at much bigger buildings, like the 20 million in Britain, then we do see people bidding. But when they get into the complexities of managing a lease, which is tenants internally repairing, which is 40% of our portfolio, where we're responsible for certain aspects of the upkeep of the building, typically the exterior fabric, they get a bit um, nervous about it. And the Irish leases, the returns are higher, but the risks are higher because, we, again, we have to manage the building. There are certain soft breaks in there. But in due course, I think the Irish market is seeing more uh, competition. I think that will lead to yield contraction in Ireland, which is very good for our net asset value prospects. What we, we don't want to talk too much about that because we think we've got kind of first mover advantage. And we currently have 220 million-ish 
of um, euro investment in Ireland, and we aim to grow that to four to five hundred million over the next two years. And for those who want to ask, maybe the office next question is, what do you do about the euro exposure? Well, we borrow 100% in euros so that we're not exposed to euros, because at the moment we think our shareholder base thinks exclusively in sterling terms. Uh, you told in, me when to stop, Keith, yeah? yeah. In, in, your, in your pharmacy, oh, sorry. sorry. In your pharmacy related revenue, can you split that into independent pharmacies, small chains, and nationals? Yep. Um, in one of the presentations on our website, you'll find that split. It is dominated by the majors like Lloyd's, Rowlands, and Boots. But where you read about the, far, the, the, the chemists having problems, it's their high street branches. We don't own any independent high street um, things like you'd find on a parade of shops. They're all integral to the medical centers. And I, I'm kind of quite fond of saying this, so I'll say it again because I'll get into trouble for saying it. Uh, you'd have to be a complete nutter to run a pharmacy next to a medical center and not be able to make money because although the internet is a threat. If you're in pain, got two screaming children, or you're like my mum, 90, right? You're gonna go into the community pharmacy and come out with your prescription. And those pharmacies are a very important part. And the other way around as well is quite interesting because the pharmacist, to quote NHS jargon, is now an integral part of the primary care team. And if you can't get an appointment to see the doctor, which regrettably is still the case in many parts of the country, the pharmacist can deal with a minor ailment, like conjunctivitis, a rash, uh, so many things, you know, um, bad flu, cold, which the doctor can't really do very much about, except rest, have some lemsips and all that sort of jazz. But the pharmacist can do that. And obviously, he can prescribe or give you some OTC medicine to deal with it and say, if it doesn't clear up, go back and see the doctor. So the doctors like having pharmacists next door because it saves them actually seeing the patients in many instances. Right, thank you. Please join me in thanking Mary and the team. Thank you very much, Richard. Okay, so the next company uh, this evening is Open Orphan, which was founded in 2017. It's got the goal of becoming Europe's leading rare disease and orphan drug focused pharma services business led by a management team with extensive industry and financial expertise. It's lift, listed both in Dublin and in London, and we've got Maurice Tracy uh, to speak about the company. Morris. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out today. So over the next 20 minutes or so, I'll give you a, an update on what's been happening with Open Orphan over the last um, effectively five months. It's under five months, in fact, since we went public in June of this year through a reverse takeover of Venn. So, as I said, you know, we're five months public through a reverse takeover of, of Venn. We want to be uh, the leading uh, European rare disease orphan product company, and we're a, a pharma services company, so we're not developing our own products. We're working on behalf of pharma companies uh, who get us to do a lot of things, for example, consulting, uh, preclinical design, uh, consulting on, on trial design, clinical trials, and then reimbursement and, and regulatory approval. So we, we service, and so that's really important because we're not in the business of having a binary, binary risk associated with the business as pharmaceutical companies have, for example. So if they're developing a drug, the drug doesn't uh, meet its endpoints, there's a huge risk and share price collapses. The company effectively can often go bust. So in our case, despite the result, we, we are guaranteed the income associated with the business. So it is a pharma services company. We're also in the rare disease space, and some, sometimes people think rare is small, a small market, but in fact, it's a huge market. 300 million people worldwide suffer from rare disease. Uh, 30 million people in Europe have rare diseases. Um, and of all those rare diseases, only 10% of them have an FDA or EMA or Japanese approval product on the market. So there's a huge market. 
It's untapped or unmet because of that 90% of those diseases that are not treated. Um, and it's growing at twice the rate of every other sector in the pharma market. So last year, for example, 58% of all the products approved by the FDA were orphan products. So it's a growth market. It's, it's a huge market. And it's growing. It's a growth market. So these are the characteristics of, as to why we're in this business. Uh, and really excited to tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing over the last uh, five months. Usual disclaimer uh, applies. Um, a little bit about the company. So we went public in June of this year through a reverse takeover of Venn. ORF is a, is a ticker. Market cap as of today, about 16 million. Uh, we're a little bit higher on the share price from when this uh, presentation was uh, developed. Um, we raised 4.5 million in equity at that point in time from institutional investors, mainly in the, in the UK, some in Ireland. And again, there's parallels between this company and the last company in that we, we operate uh, headquartered here in, in the UK, in London, uh, a lot of the business in Dublin as well, Paris and Breda, so uh, in, in Amsterdam. So it is kind of a, a European footprint. Um, when we acquired Venn, uh, it had 14.5 million in revenues, yet it was, and I'll tell you a little bit in the next slides, loss making, badly run. And actually we acquired it for a good price. We acquired it for 4 million. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. The strategy going forward is correct Venn, uh, right size it, uh, make it a little bit fit for purpose, uh, and ensure that it's, uh, it has all the expertise associated with being a consulting house in the high end mar uh, market of reimbursement and regulatory approval. Um, <coughs> so we, that's what we're doing in terms of Venn. Uh, but also the bolt-on acquisition strategy was critical as part of the, uh, the future uh, activities of the company. So we are acquiring uh, several uh, uh, consulting houses across Europe that will really add to the revenue. So the current revenues of 14.5 million from last year were guiding similar revenues this year for Venn and Open Orphan. Uh, but as part of the acquisition strategy, we hope to have a, a significant announcement before the end of this year that will be transformational in the context of the revenue. Uh, we are also, and I'll talk a little bit about those also on the slide, developing a uh, genomic health database, uh, and this is because there's such an untapped need in the rare disease space, we really want to ignite the research activities within pharma companies by really developing this tool, this research tool that will really help them identify the genetic basis of those rare diseases that are not treated, uh, and as a result of accessing our database, we will get access fees significant uh, milestone payments as they bring those products through development, and then royalties on the sales of those products. So it is slightly different from uh, just the services. It's the services with the uh, added kick because of the ongoing uh, feedback from the, from the pharma companies and our customers. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about Venn and the, you know, the different companies that we work with. Um, a lot of them are pharma leading companies uh, and in the orphan space. And we're so confident that this market is good for us, good for you as investors, <clears throat> dividend uh, in two years, and we have a very clearly defined exit strategy. The leadership team, this business is all about relationships, as you all know. Um, and so everyone in the management team, Cahal Friol, Brendan Buckley, and myself, we've been in the pharma services business or the finance uh, area all our careers. Um, just going to Cahal first, he's a stockbroker by trade. Um, has founded th three different companies. Uh, you might know some of them. Fastnet was one of them. And again, uh, on AIM, a uh, public company, raised 50 million. Um, Amrit Pharmaceuticals, another one that he's also a co founder of. Amrit, about to be listed on NASDAQ at a, about 300 million investment or valuation, excuse me. And finally, Open Orphan. So he's used to. Um, raising money on, on public, uh, with public companies um, and has been very successful on that. Brendan Buckley, a clinician by training, uh, had a, a company acquired by Icon. Icon is a clinical research organization valued at $8 billion currently, and he was the chief medical officer there for five years in the 2000s. Um, Again, huge expertise in M&A uh, as a result of uh, what he did with Icon in really bolt-on acquisition strategy there, understands clinical trials, uh, and really is a tour de force in the orphan space in Europe because he helped uh, really develop the protocols that are really the basis of the orphan drug legislation in Europe now. 
Um, before I go on, one thing I didn't say is that some of you might have asked what are orphan products. And just to be absolutely clear on that, orphan products, it's just a very simple designation that's given to products that are used to treat rare disease. And the definition of rare is it affects one in 2,000 people or less. So it's a designation, but the designation is important because why is it the fastest growing segment of the market? And these are some of the reasons why I, I believe, or we believe it is. Um, a lot of legislation was put in place in the US and Europe to really incentivize pharma companies to really get into this orphan drug space and, and rare disease space. So as a result, there's two and a half thousand products in development. Uh, they're not on the market yet. And again, this is our pipeline that we can tap into. The clinical trials you have to do associated with the, the development clinical evaluation of these products is uh, they're smaller and you typically only have to do two phases, phase one and two, and then you go for regulatory approval. Large on top, untapped market, as I said, <clears throat> um, 30 million people in Europe, and a huge uh, consulting business uh, that's grown up around that, and we're part of that. The other thing I should say is that in the US, there's 500, over 500 orphan products on the market approved. In Europe, there's only 120. So that disparity uh, is really our opportunity where we are bringing those products on behalf of those companies to Europe uh, and really putting them into the major markets in Europe. So a huge amount of business in the context of existing products on the market in, in the US, and then also the development of new products that are coming through the pipeline. And on top of that, we'll also ignite other research projects through our uh, genomic health database platform. So there's some of the incentives to really get us into this market. Um, we understand the market. And this is the, the business strategy. Um, so we acquired VEN and uh, part of the Open Orphan Services. And I'll tell you a little bit about VEN in the next slide. <clears throat> we also have the two digital uh, platforms that we're going to roll out over the next year, uh, Q1 for the uh, Genomic Health Database, and the end of the year, 2020, for uh, Virtual Rep. So VEN. It's a, it's a funny story, but it's a nice little company, 14 and a half million revenues, but it was undercapitalized, underutilized in terms of staff utilization, loss making. But despite all that, it had a fantastic list of, of customers, pharma companies, global companies, about 100 different companies which it's worked with. So the opportunity we saw was let's acquire Venn at a, at a knockdown price, which we did. We raised money, we recapitalized. 80% um, of the businesses were repeat business, so they did a good job with these companies, just badly managed. Um, strong customer base, as I said, um, and strong in the orphan uh, space. So again, we wanted to focus on that space. So the goal is to recapitalize, uh, which we're doing, and we, we put in four and a half million already, as I said. Restructure, we're right-sizing VEN. We're correcting all the deficits associated with the VEN operation that made it loss-making up to now. And we, we will, uh, we've, got, we've guided the market that we will be profitable by H2 next year. Uh, <coughs> profit uh, mar uh, making, um, re-rate based on additional uh, substantial revenues, part of the bolt-on acquisition strategy, and then launch additional services through the digital platforms. So they're what we're actively going on with, and I think you might have seen over the last few months a lot of news flow in that regard. Uh, obviously, we have Ipsen, which is a major company, now as a, as a preferred partner with Venn, Open Orphan. And that's really significant because that guarantees existing revenues, but then also future revenues going forward. We want to have this type of preferred partner re uh, relationship with every customer we have. Also with Karna Biosciences, another uh, company we've just announced, that we did consulting with them in part of their clinical trials. We're now doing the clinical trials with them. So that service expansion with Karna is also something we want to do with all the companies. This slide goes to every activity that the VEN covers. And it really covers the whole uh, late discovery, preclinical, phase one, two, and three, and marketing. So we cover the whole gamut of activities that pharma companies typically outsource. They don't do this themselves. They're good at finding the molecules, they're good at market, sales and marketing, but the in-between stuff, they always outsource. That's the business we're in. And just in terms of the track record of Venn, <laughs> this really shows what it's been doing. So over the, uh, you know, the last 10 years, actually, uh, fundamentally, because they, they acquired two companies, but there's about 150, uh, 130 programs that they've initiated in the last five years. 
And again, across all the areas you see there, oncology, cardiology, uh, neurology, virology, all the major segments of the pharma market. And across all the different types of molecules, be it small molecules, be it biologics, gene therapy. So again, the expertise within the company is, is evolving with time and as a, the type of products coming through the pharma segment is changing. So um, I guess this comes back to the initial strategy and then I'll end on Venn. Um, <clears throat> it is like um, really what we're doing is um, the, the pharma services company in Europe is serviced by two types of companies, be it the IQVIA, uh, the Paracel, the McKinsey's, the big ones. The other half is serviced by smaller companies like ourselves. We are acquiring some of those to, to really build on uh, the, the revenue um, and hope to double that by the end of the year. And so <clears throat> it is that bold on acquisition strategy that we will get as a result of that rapid revenue growth. And we've said 50 million by 2020, 22, uh, in two years from IPO. And as a result of that, be re-rated um, as other companies in, in the space, in the sector, with that type of valuation, with that type of revenue. So that's the Venn Crow consulting part of the business. Now I'm going to change tack a little bit just to talk a little bit about the genomic health database. And this is a database where we are corralling a huge amount of clinical and genomic information from rare disease patients. Um, so really what we're aiming to be, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, uh, value to, to become Europeans uh, broker of rare disease data to be the largest uh, rare disease database globally. Um, the platform is in its final phases, and I say that we worked with Empiric Logic to finalize the database. We have the software pretty much built, and I think you probably saw the announcement on Monday that we now have five pharma companies working with us to really fine tune, hone, uh, and make fit for purpose the database. So we're really excited by that because these are the companies that will be using this data. So they're helping us to fi finesse it, make sure that the data we're collecting is what's appropriate for them. And it, it's quite interesting. While it's confidential, I can't announce them and they don't even know who, who the others are. Um, all the feedback we've got from them so far has been very positive in the context of we're on the right track. The database is, is pretty much ready to go. So it's been very, it's been very kind of uh, gratifying to be working with these companies. We're also working with the patient advocacy groups. So how do the patients find out about this database? And really through the patient advocacy groups, we really are going to kind of, they're going to be our marketeers associated with making the database um, aware, making the patients aware of it. Likewise with the pharma companies, we're also bringing the advocacy groups on board as early adopters to really, again, finesse the database to make sure it's patient friendly. Uh, and we hope to announce something like that in the next week or so. So, <coughs> Um, it is a kind of a unique strategy. Of all the data we're talking about, it is out there. So we've done an analysis of how much genomic data exists with rare disease patients across Europe. And we're, we're targeting for 10,000 in, in two years for this database. Each of those data sets is valued at 5,000 euros. Um, so the, the nominal value of this database is 50 million. And that's assuming a linear take up of the data from one pharma company or from you know, over certain disease areas. We, this is a pre-competitive space, non-exclusive. So we imagine that multiple pharma companies will be looking at the same data at the same time. So the true value of this database is probably multiples of 50 million. So Q1 of 2020 is, is the rollout date once we finish the early adoption uh, beta adapter phase that we're going through right now. So again, this will lead into those pharma companies we're working through the van activities, the consulting clinical trials, who have products on the market, who will look to this database to identify new research targets that can be their new pipeline of products coming through development. Uh, finally, I'll just talk quickly about this. So this is a virtual rep, uh, the uh, second digital database. And this is really focused on, as we bring those products to Europe that were not here before, this is a digital engagement <coughs> platform whereby the companies that were doing that work on behalf of those, they can use this to really tap into the, the KOLs, the key opinion leaders, the physicians who are prescribing these drugs across Europe. Um, and really, it's, it's more a, 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 <clears throat> it's a, a, it's a virtual kind of way in which a digital platform, they can engage with these rather than having people driving around trying to promote their products. It also is slightly different from competing with a product because there's no comparator in the marketplace. These are all new products on the European market. Roll this out in, in the end of 2020. 
Uh, <clears throat> I want to just give you a sense of where the 5,000 valuation of the data set uh, comes from, and that's based on precedent in the markets. Some of the deals, you probably have heard some of them, uh, of this is what companies can garner from investment, and then these are deals that uh, companies can get from, from various activities and pharma companies who acquire the data. So the 5,000 uh, data set comes from, these are complex disease. In rare disease, the valuation is about double what it would be for complex disease. So again, based on really good precedence in the market. So I've um, given you a lot of information. It's all there, but it all sits together really nicely. Um, <clears throat> excited about the news flow. Um, management team that's fit for purpose. Uh, it's a clear growth strategy, untapped, uh, with a huge unmet need. It is the fastest growing segment of the market, as I said, and we are confident of this, that you know, we will have dividends in two years, uh, but a clearly defined exit strategy. And in the context of the bolt-on acquisition, we hope to have a major announcement before the end of this year. So thank you very much, and happy to take questions. Just um, on the database you ho you're looking to build, uh, I, I presume that the patient data coming in will not necessarily be in the same format since it's coming from different sources. How are you going to be able to handle that and how will you build something that's you know, sort of, a, of, of a value to uh, your potential customers? <clears throat> yeah, um, it's a good question. And the data will not be in the same format because it's coming directly from the patients. So the advocacy groups uh, promote the, the database. The, the patient's actually following their consent, so everything is with informed consent. Everything is also GDP or compliance. So again, because of uh, the new data legislation across Europe, um, these patients own their data, so they can elect to, to share their data with us. So the patients actually share their data, and actually there's a huge amount of studies shown that patient-derived data compared to clinical data is equally valid or as good. So patient-derived data, and then they upload their genomic information. So they do that as, as they walk through our database. So the format for every patient is the same. Okay, and then just the second one. Um, I guess you'll need sort of um, a critical size, even we're talking often diseases, so fairly small numbers, but if uh, you initially get sort of a, you know, a, a smattering of patients spread across a number of different diseases, isn't that going to be lower value than if you had sort of, uh, a sufficient concentration in one area? Yeah, um, it, it really does depend on the rare disease, but um, some d rare diseases are so prevalent that you don't need a huge amount of samples to find a target. Um, so in, in coming back to the model, is there a higher valuation on those smaller number of samples if the, if the prevalence and the genetics uh, determines that? So that, that is a really good question. Currently, we're pricing them all the same, uh, and so as we roll out, you know, that's the way it's going to be. A hundred data sets is probably the the minimum you need for the more rare diseases. So we're very confident we can get that. Coming back to what I said about the amount of data that is in Europe, there's about 200,000 patients across Europe that have whole genome sequence, and, and these are rare disease patients that have whole genome sequence. I'm not counting people who have genotype data, which is a more shallow level of genetic data, but equally valuable, uh, and that's estimated to be about a million people across Europe. When the reverse takeover was announced, um, I thought that then will simply sort of disappear. Now, can you please explain, I mean, in what sense has it been transformed? What parts of it fit into the big, um, um, you know, orphan uh, company? Yeah. Uh, I'm not very clear about that. Yeah. So then... And I, I tried to articulate that it was ma badly run. And so um, it's now we're not right-sizing it. Staff utilization, for example, was 60%. It's now up to 90%. Uh, we're, we're corralling premises so that it's, it's only the amount of premises we need. Um, and the staff numbers are being reduced. So we're, we're, we're honing it. We're cut, cutting it down to size, but so it's fit for purpose. Um, we kept the name Venn because it has a reputation, and that comes back to the pharma companies, uh, the 100 companies, repeat customers that know Venn, like Venn. So we're doing, we're maintaining that relationship, but running it in a way that's going to be profit making. I mean, do you, w when the transformation is complete, do you expect 
then labeled to, to go, or are you going to keep it? The current it? strategy is to keep it. And again, coming back to uh, the reputation it does have in terms of delivering good products back to, or good data back to customers. So we're keeping it for that reason. Okay. The management has changed, though. The management of events is completely different now. Hi, thank you. It sounds very exciting. I have two questions. Um, the first is, what impact, given you're so involved in Europe, um, is Brexit going to have in terms of the leg, uh, regulatory, regulatory um, stuff? And secondly, can you explain a bit more about what you mean by your exit strategy post scale up? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so Brexit, um, other than th because of the UK, uh, there's a guarantee that the data protection legislation won't change within the next two years. So we do have time. Um, I also look at the English current legislation, with the data protection legislation, that was pretty much a, a deployment of the EU <coughs> legislation. Um, it's, it's a very good legislation that is quite pragmatic. Um, I honestly don't think it'll change much from what's currently there. So I don't see that as a huge target. But even if it was something that became draconian and took away the ownership of data from a patient, which I think is unlikely to happen, uh, we, we'll have time to uh, correct for that. Uh, the other thing is that most of the, the whole genome sequencing, to some in the UK because of Genome England, you know, and, and rare disease was a, a focus area of that. Uh, so there is some uh, whole genome sequence there, but there's a lot outside the UK as well, across Europe. So I'm not too worried about Brexit currently. Um, and then your second question was? Um, exit, strategy. exit strategy. Yeah, uh, apologies. Um, so we're talking to lots of companies. Um, so we believe as we get above the 50 million revenues, which we will uh, achieve rapidly due to the bolt-on acquisition strategy, uh, the likes of Acuvia, um, <clears throat> you know, all the major consulting houses, Wushi Aptech, you know, all the companies out there who are in this space who don't have a franchise model, uh, who don't really have a footprint of that in Europe, we believe they would be the companies that might be interested in what we're doing. And they're also very interested in data. Thank you for that. So uh, our third company this evening is Surface Transforms, which is uh, uh, one of the rare manufacturers of carbon ceramic brakes used uh, primarily for cars, but also in some aircraft. Um, this is the year of great transformation. This is a company that spent many years developing these products, and we've finally got to the stage where they've started to land serious orders from the big car manufacturers. Um, we're very fortunate to have the, the whole management team here, David Bundred, the chairman, <laughs> Kevin Johnson, CEO, and Michael Cunningham, the CFO. And I think Kevin is going to do the presentation. Kevin. OK, thanks for the introduction, first of all. And, and, I, and as I, we've just been told, I've got great backup here, and they're on the front row. So if you have any questions for me, and I can answer them, these guys will, I'm sure. And they'll be around afterwards for any uh, networking event as well. So we are a British manufacturer. Um, our product is uh, on that first slide there. We make carbon ceramic brake discs for cars, mainly. Um, there's a picture on the next slide. I'll show you where they fit on our car in case you're not familiar, familiar with how brakes work on a car. Uh, we're located up in Liverpool in the northwest. And uh, we've been, as we said, we've been doing this for over a decade uh, in development. And that's, that's a sign of how difficult this product is to design, create, and manufacture. Uh, but we're very pleased to where we are now. We've, we've had a transformational year in effect, and that's not a pun on the name, but it has happened, and we've announced a number of deals this year, and I'll talk you through all of that, as well as the market as well. So let's start with uh, what we do. Um, there's a picture of a, an exotic-looking car up there. Um, our market is luxury and performance cars. Um, our product, as I say, sits inside the wheel of that there, so it sits in all four corners of the car, so they're all wheels all round. And uh, alongside a caliper, and the caliper is usually a bright color, you can just see a little bit of yellow inside that wheel. A caliper activates some brake pads which squeeze against the uh, brake disc. We manufacture the brake disc, and uh, for performance cars, we're really, the market is about replacing iron rotors. Now, iron rotors have been around for 50 years on cars. 
And uh, this disruptive technology of carbon ceramic brakes is what's changing the marketplace in terms of the performance in luxury car market. What are the uh, reasons for changing a, a brake from iron to a carbon ceramic? Firstly, we've got uh, brake performance. Um, we talk about consistent braking across all the environments you might encounter in the car, so right from driving around town right up to more spirited and high performance driving, whether you're driving on a track or on a road at night. Um, and we talk about consistent braking. You'll experience brake fade um, if you're at high temperatures on iron rotor where you lose the pedal and it's quite disconcerting if you're trying to press the pedal and there's nothing there on your car. Um, we talk about weight reduction. Um, iron rotors versus a carbon ceramic rotor. Uh, there's a 50% weight reduction when you swap the light for light part from the two. Now that equates to about five, six kilos per rotor. You multiply that up by four for a car. So we talk about a 20, 25 kilo weight saving for swapping an iron rotor for a carbon ceramic rotor. That's significant in its own right because it's unsprung mass, it's hanging off the chassis and it's also rotating mass because the wheels rotate. But it's more important than that. If you can take weight out off the chassis, <coughs> you can then design in slimmer uprights, slimmer suspension, slimmer components that feed into the car. We talk about saving about 5%, so about 100 kilos off the car. Now, 5% of the car's weight gives you fantastic improvements in handling, comfort and refinement, and also the emissions. So if you talk about uh, how you reduce the emissions, you can do that with uh, the powertrain and the engine, but you can also do that by reducing weight on a car, and that's quite a very, becoming very important. It's a wear part on a car, so iron rotors wear out relatively quickly. We talk about ceramic rotors. We can talk about ceramic rotors lasting the lifetime of the car, uh, so they don't become a wear part, but it really depends on the driving. Um, there will be some people out there that can destroy anything um, if they wish to. So if you're driving on normal road conditions and normal driving within the speed limits and so forth, they probably last the lifetime of the car. But if you're driving it in a more spiritedly on a track, we talk about it lasting four times the life of an iron rotor. But nonetheless, it's very significant improvement in life. Let's talk about the aesthetics. They don't corrode. So in terms of the brake disc, if you see any rain on the car, and it's been out in the rain and left there, you'll see that rust starts to appear on your iron rotor. Um, that can be unsightly. It doesn't look very good uh, for a high performance or luxury car. It can also cause galvanic corrosion where you can get the brake just seizing against the brake pad. We don't see that on a carbon ceramic. More importantly, it doesn't generate as much dust as a traditional iron rotor and pad will make. Now that's important because it doesn't get the wheels dusty and people like their wheels to look clean, but it's also becoming an environmental issue in terms of brake dust becoming a, um, something that the regulations are starting to focus, focus on to say, we'd like to reduce the amount of brake dust that's deposited on roads. And as I said at the start, that these yellow calipers, they're normally accompanied by a lime green yellow caliper, and that makes it instantly recognizable that the car has ceramics on it. So there's a prestige to having a carbon ceramic brake, and you can spot it straight away by having a bright caliper on there. And it's got this high-tech recognizable image. And as I say, not, not at the bottom there, I talk about the braces again, and it's an environmental improvement that we can reduce that brake pad dust. So those are the reasons for swapping out an iron rotor. I don't talk about it on here in terms of the text, but there's a cost difference between an iron rotor and a ceramic rotor, and it's why we only talk about the performance and luxury car market. If I try and give you a, iron rotors have been developed over 50, 60 years, and the cost of an iron rotor has come down to be very competitive. We don't see a ceramic rotor ever trying to compete against an iron rotor in terms of the marketplace, which is why we don't talk about this product getting up, up on a Ford Focus or a Ford Monday or that type of car. It's typically four, maybe four to six times the cost of an iron rotor, so it isn't going to end up penetrating that part of the market. But it is, all the benefits that I've talked about here are more, are more than enough for all of the vehicle manufacturers to put it on the high-end cars that, we're, that we, we talk about. Now, if I talk about those high-end cars and talk about defining the marketplace, we, we define that marketplace by the retail price of the car. Cars above 50,000 to say 75,000 as a retail price can withstand the cost of a ceramic on the main braking axle, typically the front axle. Um, so there'll be two rotors per car on those. And cars above 75,000 and upwards would take it on all four corners. So there'd be four on those. And when you take out the volume of those cars in those two segments, 
add those up, times it by two and four. We have a future sale price that we don't sell today for, but we know that's where the, the market is going. It comes to about four million rotors, and that in total comes to about a two billion pound market. So although we don't talk about it going into the main volume market, we're very happy to be focusing on a two billion pound market in terms of the market we can address. Now let's talk about some competition and just talk about the market landscape. Um, I know in the introduction there, Keith said it, there aren't many suppliers in the world. I need to, there is one de facto competitor to us today, that is the de facto standard. Um, they manufacture about 200 brake, carbon cylinder brake discs a year. Uh, their revenues are circa 140 million pounds. And they supply all of these guys that I've got down at the bottom here. Now, one thing that's unusual in the automotive market is having one single source of a component and no competition. And that's really where we come in. So in terms of when you're looking around the world for alternative supplies, incredible alternative supplies of carbon cylinder brake discs, that's where we talk about ourselves and being the only credible alternative in the world. I am aware that there are some companies in China, Korea, um, parts of, of, of uh, Europe as well that talk about having technology. But in all honesty, I know them very well. I've seen them all. I've, I've talked to the owners. They're not very credible in terms of having a product for the market. So we really do talk about this market being ourselves as well as our competitor, Brembo SGL, as being the two players in that marketplace. And that's what we positioned ourselves. So in terms of position for this market, not having competition, not having an alternative source, not being able to grow that market in terms of capacity. Um, all of these OEMs down here, these vehicle manufacturers, are determined to create that competition. And there's a pull from these guys to pull through a competitor and create that competitive environment. And that's where we've, we've been working on for a number of years. And we've had those breakthrough contacts that I'll talk about in a little while um, with, with some of these guys down at the bottom. Now, let's just talk about the strategy of the business. Um, I've touched on it already. We want to be world class. Uh, we have a world class product. We want to be a profitable manufacturer of our product, which is carbon ceramic brake discs. And we also do what we are design responsible for these parts. So in terms of what we do, we don't just manufacture them. We design them. We have the expertise and the knowledge and, and the know-how how to engineer them to make them work on a car. Now, I've talked about the market. Our customers are clearly the OEMs. We talk about being a tier one supplier. There are some cases where we are a tier two supplier, where there's a system integrator that integrates the brake system. We have one example of that, but in the majority of cases, we typically supply direct to the vehicle manufacturer as a tier one supplier. And in terms of the, the contract pipeline we talk about, our customers are telling us their, their potential demand in terms of what they use for carbon ceramic brake discs. And when we use a typical selling price for the future, it comes in at well over 50 million pounds per annum. Now, talk about our product and I'm here I'm comparing it to our competitors the Brembo SGL product rather than an iron rotor um, our product we talk about is superior to our competitor and in a, in a nutshell really we make plywood so we have long carbon fibers that that move through the part and create strength this is our competitor who makes chipboard where they chop up that fiber and, and then pour it into a mold and set it and we also have a very highly ordered material around those fibres which give us very good thermal properties. And what brakes are about, and it's a very hostile environment for brakes, is about being durable and being able to handle convert the conversion of energy from kinetic into heat. So they get very hot and they have to last in those environments for a long, long time. So having high strength and having high thermal conductivity results in a much better product than our competitors. However, when, you talk, when we talk about price and we look at the cost of manufacture here, although we're relatively small compared to our competitor today, where they make, they make 200,000 brake discs, uh, we think we're competitive on costs, um, particularly on the capital cost in terms of equipment. And that's because when you, when you break it down to the processes and the materials involved, we're very similar in terms of the materials. We both use carbon fibers. We both put more carbon in there. And we both put silicon. They're the fundamental ingredients of the carbon ceramic brake disc. So they're the same. Um, however, the processes are slightly different, but our processing costs we know are very similar to what they do in terms of power, use of labor, use of machining tools and the like, and therefore we can say we're competitive. And we actually have an edge in terms of the capital cost because we don't use molds. So there you have to create a tooling charge for molds. We just create a program that a machine tool is designed for and then machines the design we want out of it. 
In terms of quality, it's important in the automotive industry, this is a safety critical part that we're certified to all the quality standards. We are, um, and we maintain those standards. And the other key requirement that our customers want is supply chain and capacity. In terms of the supply chain, we need to be independent. We need to, we've highly integrated our supply chain, so we only buy in fibre uh, from our supply chain, and that's a, a precursor to the carbon fibre we need. So it's a, it's a commodity product, so it's avail readily available. We then buy in silicon, that comes straight from the mine, and then our other raw material is, is additional carbon, and that comes from natural gas, the stuff you use for your central heating system, so it's a utility. So we're well, we're well integrated and we're secure for our supply chain. And in terms of capacity, what we've been working on over the last couple of years or so is building capacity, our first, if you like, mainstream OEM manufacturing cell. We've made that investment. We have a small manufacturing cell to go with it for our smaller company, smaller businesses with our customers. So we talk about having capacity for revenues up to 16 and a half million. But now importantly, our footprint at our facility is expandable. Um, and we've designed the manufacturing cells to be modular so they can be replicated. So we talk about getting our footprint up to 100,000 discs and that's where we talk, then can enable ourselves to deliver the 50 million pound per annum revenues that our customers talk about. Now, I mentioned at the start, it's been, a, it's been a, a good year, transformational year for us. And what we've been able to talk about now is the contracts that have come through this year and how that's created our contract roadmap and pipeline. We've put it in a sort of a graphical form here and we're trying, to, we're trying to look out past 19 into 2021 and 22. Um, I should say we have an existing business where we developed our product with what we call near OEMs and our retrofit business. A near OEM is a, is a, a vehicle manufacturer that makes perhaps 50, 100 cars a year, so isn't a mainstream um, manufacturer. They are very interested in developing new technology, so they were ideal for us to, to partner with as we were developing the product over the last decade. So we have existing recurring business with these near OEMs. We have about five to 10 of these guys who, who put our product on their cars. Um, and the retrofit market is where we offer our superior product to someone who's already got a car with perhaps ceramics on or wants ceramics on there, and they can buy ours as an upgrade kit. So they can buy it from us directly or through our distribution network and then put it on their car and get the performance benefits of a ceramic. So that's recurring business. We've been doing that for a number of years and we see that continuing. It's worth about one and a half, perhaps growing slightly, so maybe two million a year. We announced before this year that we were on the Aston Martin Valkyrie. That's the, the car I showed you at the start, the very exotic looking car. Um, that's worth about one and a half million per annum. It runs over about one and a half years. And we should see that the revenue start to come through in 2020 and 2021. Now this year we announced a new contract with, and I apologise, I use these, <coughs> these sort of code names, OEM, six, five, there are us. We, we, we are very sensitive to our customers' uh, confidentiality. They like to keep things secret from their competitors so they don't know what they're doing. Um, this is a British car manufacturer. Um, OEM six, we were able to announce that we're on their next car. Um, and the development revenue should start in 2020. So we were selected this year, development revenue 2020-21, with series production starting at the end of 21 and really kicking in in 2022. That's worth just under 2 million per annum, and that will run for three years. So we're talking about contracts now that don't just are multi-year contracts and are secure. We then announced, I think in the middle of the year, um, a contract with OEM5, similar time scale. So we, we announced it within, a few, I think, a month or so of OEM6. Similar time for the... We, for the development revenue we receive as they integrate and develop the car. And actually it starts at a similar time in terms of series production and it's at a similar value, so it's just shy of two million per annum. That car, however, runs for, I think, about six to seven years in terms of its series supply. So we talked about a contract value here, I think, and this is a European uh, car manufacturer of about 12 million in total, 12 million euros as a contract value. We also announced the Koenigsegg, these guys are a small OEM, but they're becoming more and more mainstream in terms of who knows them and so forth. And they announced this on their new car, which is being developed right now through 2020 and should be launched at the end of 2020. And again, that's worth a, a recurring revenue of just show, of about 300,000, just about shy of half a million. And that's recurring for another three years. So when you add up, and I should talk about the last one here, this was announced, I think, a few months ago with OEM One, another British car manufacturer relatively small but this is the first 
if you like, we hope, of a future business that we will win with them. They announced a special car that they were doing with our brakes on worth about £400,000 a year. This has all happened in the last six months, really. So what that's allowed us to do is, 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 is demonstrate, if you add all those up, they come to just shy of £6 million. So it demonstrates now how we are going to reach profitability. So all that investment we've been making over the last 10 or so years, we're now seeing to come through in terms of moving through cash generation. Cash generation should start in 2020 through 21, and then we'll become profitable in 22 with these multi-year contracts that we've got. And as I say, this is the beginning for us in terms of what we want to do. To give you an idea of what our customers are talking to us about in terms of their future demand, and just talking about the customers, first of all, that we've announced contracts with, OEM5 demand they're talking to us about is over 20,000 discs per annum. And I should say, with OEM5, we're in quite detailed discussions with them for their future models, so much so that we, we have detailed a pricing matrix that looks at, as their volumes increase, how the price can be moved to where we think they should think it should be. OEM6 is, a, is a over 10,000 discs per annum, again, which will be layered as you introduce the next model and the next model after that with these multi-year contracts. It adds up to about 10,000 discs a year. And similarly with OEM1, we've only just started with OEM1, but their demand is over 15,000 discs a year. Now, I haven't mentioned OEM3, 2 and 5, but that completes the series of 1 to 6, if that makes sense, in our code. Um, we, we love these together because OEM2, 3 and 4 are all part of the same group. They are car manufacturers in their own right that you would recognise. But OEM3 is given, is given the lead in terms of bringing us on as a supplier. Um, and then once we are brought on as a supplier by OEM3, it would then be offered up as part of their parts bin to OEM2 and 4. Clearly, they're, they're one of the big guys in the marketplace with a, with a demand of well over 100,000 discs. Now, what do we need to do to continue that success we've had this year uh, with the selection criteria? For, firstly, for OEM1, 5 and 6. Our product's already approved, it's already being used on cars, so we're through that product approval stage. It's available now for their selection in terms of product that's in their parts bin. As I've touched on earlier, pricing's well understood. Remarkably, we've known the pricing and the pricing elasticity curve in terms of volume and price for the last six, seven years. It's not changed, and that's a function of it being a monopoly market. We, we have our planning for a, a future price, which is not what we sell for today but our pricing is well defined and understood by our customers and is agreed. We're yeah, talking, yeah, okay. Talk about capacity. Well, I've talked, I've touched on building the capacity. It's already there. Um, now we're trying to fill it and we've got the modular structure in, in place to add new modules. And the key for us is being, a, is being a good supplier. Now that we've got those contracts and we're supplying, it's about keeping going and making sure we deliver to their requirements. I touch, I'll touch on OEM3 as I've, I've highlighted slightly different. There is a product requirement that we still need to achieve to be selected, and it's this environment. It's a very strenuous and destructive environmental test. We think we're close, but there's a little bit more work to be done before we can be selected in terms of product for that. <coughs> so I'll just focus in on operational, and then that's me done, and then I can summarize if, you, if that makes sense. So in terms of price and then cost reduction, we have pricing in place. We've worked very hard on our cost reduction so we can achieve good margins. We achieve good margins today. We expect that to continue, and we've built in some cost reduction to achieve good margins for the future pricing and volume we expect. And we'll see that continue. Cost reduction never stops in the automotive industry. It's all about cost reduction in the future. We have very good ideas and actually detailed plans for how we'll continue to drive down the cost and see the... Uh, the volumes grow and the, and the margin being maintained. On the product, our focus is on the completion of environmental tests, principally for OEM3. It's not required for the others, but we want to get that done. And as I say, in terms of capacity, I've given you a floor plan here. This is our complete site. Um, we've got our small volume cell. That, that's good for about four and a half million pounds in terms of revenue, and that services both the development and near OEMs and retrofit. And then we've got our first OEM cell here, which is coming on stream at the end of this year. It'll be in two phases. Um, we'll bring first phase on at the end of this year, and then through 2020, it'll, it'll come into the full, full capacity available. And that's worth about 12 million in terms of revenue. Hence why we talk about having a site worth about 16 and a half million in capacity. But you'll notice we can then add cell two here, three, four, and five. 
Um, and then if you, they'll, they'll do 20,000 discs each, and hence we can talk about a capacity of 100,000 for the footprint. Now to do that uh, capacity build, we talk about the investment being about 10 million uh, per cell, and it's about an 18 month payback in terms of uh, that investment. So just to summarize, and then we'll take questions. We have had a transformative year. Uh, we've announced contracts with both OEM5, 6 and 1 and Koenigsegg, um, and we expect more to follow. That's allowed us to talk about this now solid contract roadmap with multi-year recurring revenues. Those revenues take us through cash break even and profitability over the next couple of years. And that's principally driven by, uh, by Valkyrie and OEM1 and then Koenigsegg, and then obviously the bigger multi-year program with OEM6 and 5. The key is going forward to continue the success and win more contracts for more models is to be that good supplier and also to complete those environmental testings for OEM3. And operationally is to maintain those margins, improve our costs by further cost reductions on the processes and then build further capacity. But as I say, we already have capacity for circa 6 and a half, 17 million. I'll take questions. Thank you. Um, my question revolves around your ability and capacity to upscale yeah. into, this rev uh, into this demand. So, for instance, do you need for when you bring cell one on to again re qualify the product that comes off of cell one? It's, it's, a really good, yeah, it's a really good question. The answer is no. The reason for building the cell ahead of time, if you think about the start of production for OEM 5 and 6 is towards the end of 2021. So we are building that cell now so that we don't have to requalify. If we did it in, say, late 21, we would then have to do some validation work to prove off those, that equipment. But it's done as part of the development programme. To uh, the scaling up of your operation, what is it you need? You can you can put the capital investment in, but you know what, what do you need? Personnel of a certain qualification. Um, the scale up is is principally capital and power. We, uh, you know, the, in terms of skills of, of personnel, yes, there's a level of engineering, but a lot of that engineering is being done on cell one, so it's a replication of that cell, if that makes sense. In terms of scale up and processing, that's already been done. In terms of people and resource, we don't actually use a lot of labor. A lot of these processes are automated. They run without labor requirements. So the cell doesn't suck in a lot of labor. It's purely down to the capital and, and building for the demand of the customer. Okay, one final question, please. Um, you say you've built in a, a cost decline, uh, sorry, a, cro a cost and a price decline curve. Absolutely. Can you give some indication of, let's say, cost of a disc today if that was a hundred yes where you're expecting the cost of that disc to be in say three years time or four in, years in four well can i i can give it I, i'd go along we, what you've got to realize is that there's a long these programs run for seven seven typically seven or eight years so rather than do it in three years that's probably not the right horizon for a start but if i give you the the same metric in terms of a hundred it will go down by a third. <coughs> but in return for that, that's where the volumes come, where you talk about 100,000 discs. So, um, and that, that we expect to happen over perhaps five to seven years, but it's not, it isn't that short term, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. You said that yours cost about four times the cost of an uh, iron rotor mm -hmm. to install per car. What does that make the cost per car for, um, for your product? Um, I'm not sure I can, without, are you talking about? Average. The average, okay. Um, can I put it in a function of the cost of the car, if that makes sense, so rather than telling you an absolute finite number? Where we, th where we, where we are today, the cost is probably, 4% of the car, okay, to give you an idea. Um, where we think we're going, we use the example of an alloy wheel as the, as the good example here. When you tick the box to have a particular alloy wheel, that's a couple of thousand, maybe 3,000 for alloy wheels. That's where we're going. If you were to tick 
And to give you another example, to try and give you a bit more, if you tick the option today, on, and I'll use a Porsche as an example, where you say, I like the car, and it's got an option for the ceramics, you'd pay about £6,000. So it, it's going to halve, if that makes sense, in terms of the future. Also, what are the barriers to entry? Um, is there any intellectual property or whatever covering functionality, design, or manufacturing process, or anything like this? Sure. Uh, th there's a mountain of intellectual property. It's not... It's not necessarily in patents, but we do have a, a few patents. But the product can't be reverse engineered, first of all. You can't, it's not like a molecule in chemistry where you can go and analyse it and say, that's what we've got. Once it's made, it's made. It's a bit like baking a cake in that regard. You, you know what's in it, but you don't know how it was put there. And our process is incredibly knowledge intensive, know how in each process. You know, we were very fortunate to give a capital markets there a few months ago, and we gave people a tour around. <coughs> And each, at each process, there's probably 20, 30 secrets, know-how bits in each one. And then you go through the process and say, and there are about 20 processes. So the, the combination of knowing exactly what to do is, is part of the reason why it's taken us so long to get here, if that makes sense. Um, but it's, it's incredibly vast. Two, two quick questions. Um, none of the <clears throat> OEMs that you list are American. Do Americans not use, American car manufacturers not use ceramic brakes? Well, okay, another good question. Most of the, they do. So the simple answer is yes, they do. Um, but if you look at the market as a whole, 90 plus percent of the performance luxury car market is either in, is mainland Europe, Germany, and the UK. There is a small amount in the US that's not to say we don't talk to them, we do, but they're a smaller part of the market. Okay, that leads nicely on to the second question. Is one of your, is the ambition for you to build one of your cells and manufacturing capability closer to the OEMs, say in Germany or Northern Italy? Because presumably these items come in just in time or just in sequence. Um, it, they will do. Not for the, these particular contracts we talk about right now aren't quite like that. But as you move through the different models, it'll become much more just in time and in sequence. Um, the answer is no. The answer is we would, if we're going to build the next facility, we will be building it in a, a low cost energy country. So, you know, interestingly, the US is a low cost energy country. So that would be a, that would be a good example. But so is Norway, for example, or Iceland. I'm not suggesting that's where we'd go. But Power is about 25% of the cost to make a part. So it's a, it's a fundamental piece of the puzzle. So hence, if we're going to do something, you can manage the just-in-time bit by, we could have an assembly, you know, I haven't got the picture, but we could have an assembly plant where you bring the rotor and the bell together to be just in time. But you'd want your, you want manufacture in a low, a low energy environment, low cost energy environment. So do you push solar and wind? I mean, you're in Liverpool, so, yeah. you know, you get a lot of fog. We get a lot of wind, actually, as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the answer is, where do I think this company will be in another five to ten years' time? One of our core competencies will be about, will we be generating our own power? Combined heat and power is something we're looking at right now, um, of generating our own power. One of our processes actually has a waste stream of gas, which is, which is highly rich for power, and we're looking to recycle that to generate our power ourselves. So we, we will inevitably become part of a power generation company. Yeah, so I think it might be worthwhile for the audience uh, just explaining the ownership of SGL, uh, Brembo, yeah, and point. the implications of that. Yeah, so, you know, we have one competitor, first of all, a company called Brembo SGL. That's a joint venture between SGL Carbon and Brembo SPA, and it's one's Italian, one's German. Um, now, what's interesting about that, also from a, a competitive <coughs> landscape point of view, is that SGL Carbon is, has got a significant ownership by BMW. Not only that, the Quant family, who are the owners of BMW, also have a significant ownership of SGL Carbon. So there's a further issue in terms of the other car manufacturers, in terms of the supply chain and security of the supply chain. Not only is it single source and the monopoly, they're also significantly owned by one of their competitors as well.
you, uh, thank you, Kevin. So the uh, final company to speak this evening is uh, Non-Standard Finance. Non-Standard Finance provides uh, unsecured loans to adults in the UK of uh, varying types and in varying ways. Uh, the team's had a pretty busy year. They've had a brush with uh, Provident Financial in the last 12 months, so this is a really opportune moment to uh, to catch up on the business and understand the investment case. And we've got uh, both Peter Reynolds, head of IR, with us, and John Gillespie, who takes over as CFO uh, in the spring and uh, is uh, currently deputy CFO. And I think it's Peter that's going to uh, be speaking. I have to compliment Hardman for a you know quite a selection of different companies and hope we're not going to disappoint as the last one but tell you a bit about non-standard finance so very much we do what it says on the tin so as Keith said we provide unsecured credit to uh, the 10 to 12 million people who can't borrow from a high street bank um, we were set up and listed in 2015 um, by a chap called John Van Cuffler who ran Provident Financial for 23 years six years as chief executive and 17 as chairman and over that period, he delivered a 40-fold return for his investors. And so on the back of that, when he retired from Provident, he was uh, thinking about what he was going to do next and just saw a major opportunity in this marketplace. So hopefully I can give you a bit more um, information about that. So just in terms of the, the scale of the opportunity, really the point here is that this is not a niche um, this is a large marketplace. As I said, 10 to 12 million people in the United Kingdom cannot borrow from the bank where their salary or, or the, the money that they, they earn goes into. Um, and really that, that comes from um, two sources. So why won't the banks lend um, to all these people? Um, firstly, people are on low, low pay or low income or variable income, so self-employed is a big um, potential source of demand and we know that 15% of the workforce is self-employed. Um, or they're low paid. 18% um, of the workforce is uh, two thirds of the, uh, of the average, which is deemed to be um, low paid. Um, and uh, so that's a big source of potential demand as well. Um, or they're credit impaired in some way. Something has gone wrong in their past. You know, you find you miss a credit card bill, you fail to pay your uh, mobile phone, then you can find yourself, your credit score is low, the banks won't lend to you. Um, similarly, if you uh, missed a council tax payment or, or are pursued through the courts, you get a county court judgment against you, that will stay on your credit file for six years. Last year, one million county court judgments were issued and automatically that will mean you're, you're scored out by the banks, they won't want to touch you. And you've got, you've got 14 million people who are using unauthorised overdrafts. So th this, is, this is a large pool of people who are underserved. So that's the sort of demand side. Well, what about the supply side? And this is some data from LEK. And this is just the, the, the level of outstanding loans of unsecured and other credit to uh, the non-standard market. So people who are not borrowing from high street banks. And you can see that um, post-financial crisis, in aggregate, there was a bit of a decline because a lot of the prime lenders who had businesses in the subprime space decided they wanted to exit. So they just ran off. Um, those loan books and you can see the sort of decline here and then gradually starts to pick up and there's a whole variety of different types of non-standard lending you've got you know mail order you've got store cars credit unions and we sit in this other unsecured products but even within that there's probably around 11 different categories and we're in three of them um, and I'll just go into and describe each of those in a second but before I do so, just a bit about us. So you've got the overview about who, who is non-standard finance. So we're a national player. We listed in 2015. We raised 100 million as a cash shell and then went on um, the acquisition trail. And we've acquired three businesses um, and are now um, all over the country serving, um, you know, probably over, over closer to 200,000 customers now. Uh, 140 offices, we've got around 900 staff, we've got 900 self-employed agents, um, which I'll come on to in a minute. And we've built a loan book of 336 million. This is at the, at the half year. As I said, we're in three businesses. So we're the number one branch-based lending uh, company in the UK to um, the credit impaired. Um, we're the number two in the guarantor loans business. Um, so behind uh, Amigo, which is the market leader. And we're the number three in home credit 
um, behind Provident and Morse's Club, which are two other listed groups. Um, all of our businesses are fully authorised by the FCA. This is a highly regulated space and we're listed on the main market. So a bit about each of our divisions. So as I say, we've got three businesses. Um, so the first, our largest business is in branch-based lending, everyday loans. Uh, we're the number one in the market. In fact, we're the only branch-based lender servicing the credit impaired in the UK. Um, we bought that business in April 2016, and since we acquired it, we've pretty much doubled the loan book. Um, and we've doubled the size of the network. When we acquired it, it had 36 branches. It's now got 73. Um, so we've grown it very aggressively, just under 70,000 customers. And typically, the loan size between one and 15,000 um, pounds, anywhere from 12 to 18 months up to five years in length. And the APR ranging anywhere from around 24%, so that's pretty much the same as a credit card, but all the way up to someone who is deeply subprime with very thin credit file, no credit history, we might look to charge them an APR of up to 249%, but that would be typically for a very short-term small loan. And this is, the customers here are really Joe average. So earning average income around 30,000 pounds, they're salaried, um, and that, would, that really is the, the typical customer for us. Second business is, uh, second largest business is Guarantor Loans. As I said, we're the number two in the market um, behind Amigo Loans, um, another large listed group. We've got a loan book of around um, 100 million now. Um, when we acquired, uh, we acquired the two businesses um, to, to generate the Guarantor Loans division. Um, but on acquisition, that was around 40 million um, loan book, and it's now over 100. So we've grown it very aggressively over quite a short time frame. Um, at the half year, in the first half, we grew the loan book by 53%. Um, around 30,000 customers, and again, the loan size very similar. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with what a guarantor loan is, I mean, when I bought my first flat, my, my father acted as, as guarantor. That was the only way I could get the building society to lend me the money. This is formalizing that product, uh, that idea, if somebody wants to borrow money by having a guarantor, they're able to borrow at a much lower APR than they would be able to if they were borrowing on their own. Again, a slightly lower level of income for this type of customer, and typically this is a younger person, might be someone got their first job, um, they need a car to get to work, um, they've got no credit history because maybe they maxed out their credit card at university or didn't pay their mobile phone bill, and by having an uncle, aunt, mum, dad act as the guarantor, they can get the loan that they need um, and get on the credit, credit ladder. And lastly, the th uh, third business um, is in home credit. So this is a traditional doorstep lending business. Um, this is an industry that's been going since 1880. Um, and the, um, the agent goes to the house, um, the, the loan is made in the house, and the agent goes back, typically weekly, to collect um, what is a relatively small sum the size of the loans are, are pretty small. You can see there between 100 and 1,000 pounds, typically. Um, and the loans are very short, so anywhere from 24 to 63 weeks. But typically, our biggest products are in the 33 and the, and the 46-week products. Got around 90,000 customers. And again, we've got you know, 900 agents who are going up garden paths every week, talking to their customers, lending, and collecting. Quick snapshot, the first half year results. Um, so loan book was up 26% um, versus the first half of last year, as I said, to 336 million. Revenues are up 12%. Our operating profits are up 28%, so growing nicely. And earnings per share were up 13%. Um, we are paying dividends. These are, these are all half year figures. And at the back of your packs, you can see I put the full year numbers so that you've got a, um, a full year representation. But just to show you the, the sort of dynamics of, uh, of where we're at um, in the first half, um, we are, um, as I say, we're paying dividends and we have a progressive dividend policy and we're targeting around a 50% um, payout ratio. Just in a bit more detail about the performance of the business, just going through some of the key metrics. So in terms of the loan book, and here you can see in the chart I've split the loan book growth out by the three businesses. And you can see that everyday loans, are, our branch-based lending business, is the bulk of the, of the business. It really is the engine of growth. Uh, that grew 22% in the first half. 
Guarantor loans is a, is a relatively new um, segment um, uh, for, for the group. Um, and as I say, we're the number two player and have been able to grow that um, very strongly. It's a really popular, a popular product. Home credit is a very mature um, industry um, and that's you know, growing more slowly but still profitable as I'll come on to show. In terms of revenue, it um, follows quite a similar path to um, uh, or a similar pattern to the loan book growth. Um, revenue in the, um, in the home credit business, of course, is, is higher as a proportion um, relative to loan book because, because the loans are so short, we're getting those paid back much more quickly within, within a year. So revenue, again, branch-based lending grew 22%, guarantor loans grew 40%. Home credit went, went, went back slightly. But in terms of operating profit, um, all three businesses grew well in the first half. Um, home credit grew very strongly indeed, more than doubling. <coughs> and, and the reason was um, th there was a reference to our, our attempt to buy Provident um, earlier this year. But prior to that, we'd already taken nearly 500 people in combination of agents and, and managers from that business. And so we've been able to grow very strongly over the last couple of years. And despite that business being very mature, very mature marketplace, we'd grown the loan book by over 40% over the last few years. So, so operating profit growing nicely in the first half. Looking forward, and we had our Q3 trading update um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and what we said at that, um, at that trading update was that from a trading perspective, um, everyday loans, our branch-based lending business, going pretty well. Um, strong loan book growth, rates of delinquency or you know, bad debts was in line with our expectations. Guarantor loans, the level of uh, volume growth was a, a bit softer than we were expecting, but uh, still strong year-on-year -year growth. And again, delinquency uh, or bad debts in line. And home credit, the volumes were a bit lower than we were expecting, but the level of bad debts was much lower, and with the result that we were um, pretty happy with where that business was performing. And you know, in our industry and in many others indeed, you know, lots of people are talking about, well, when's the next recession going to come and what happens um, to these businesses? And we've, we've been looking at that and very closely indeed. And you know, the key thing for us is we, as we don't know when the next recession is going to come, um, but we have had eight years of reasonably steady, albeit pedestrian, you want to say it in, the, in recent years, but we've still had growth. And if you look back over history, there aren't many periods um, at when you see more than 10 years without a downturn. So you know, we don't know when it's going to come, but we're getting ready for it. And what, what we've been doing to position ourselves ahead of that is high risk adjusted margins, which we've got in all three businesses. Um, we've been you know, looking at tightening our scorecards so that you know, we can be more selective about the lending that we do. Having long-term funding in place, uh, we've got debt facilities out to 2023, so we don't have to pay any of that back, which is good. Um, and we've been looking to moderate our pace of growth. And what we, the table you can see here is we have moderated our, our um, expectations for loan book growth. Um, we think that's the right thing to do. And we've also increased our provisions because, look, we don't know. We're not seeing any signs of a downturn, but, but we're getting ready for it. And under IFRS 9 accounting, for, for those of you who follow that, um, and I'm looking at Mark here, um, is um, we have to get ahead of that. And the standard is very clear that you need to look out. And if you think that something could have an impact and you've got a, a, a macroeconomic scenario, looking at the Bank of England stats um, and, and views on their scenario, then um, we want to just take a slightly more cautious view. And that's what we're doing. Because we think that'll position us well for the next recession. So just in terms of outlook and how we, how, we look, how we look at things, we feel we're in a really strong place. We've got leadership positions in all three segments of our market, um, and that's capable of delivering good returns, uh, return on asset and paying dividends. The market is a large and underserved uh, segment of the population. It's one we know and understand very well. Um, as I say, we've got leading positions in all three segments. Um, we're highly focused on delivering returns for our investors. The, since we did the IPO in 2015, we have grown incredibly quickly, doubling size in branch-based lending, more than doubling the size of our guarantor loans business, a 40% increase in our um, home credit business. And the focus very much now is, well, let's moderate our rate of growth, and we can enhance the level of returns. Um, 
as I say, we have long-term funding in place. Uh, we've got a 330 million of debt facilities um, provided by the credit funds and um, RBS, and uh, the 285 of that's not repayable until 2023, and the um, uh, bank facility is to 2022. So we're, we're in good shape on that front. No change to our dividend policy. As I say, we're targeting a 50% payout ratio, and we're looking at a, a 3P um, full year dividend this year. We're currently trading at 26p, which, according to Mark's recent research, puts us on a dividend yield of about 11%, rising to about 15% in um, uh, a couple of years' time. So um, I think that's, uh, that probably summarizes it pretty well. So I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Yeah. And I've got John Gillespie here as a uh, deputy CFO as well, just in case there's a complex question I can't answer. Obviously, the people you're lending to are more high risk. So um, what proportion of your people actually default and how much of your time is taken up perhaps on litigation, trying to get your money back from those people? Or do you just write off the bad debt and say, forget it? Yeah, so... Um so it's a topic we discuss often as to whether we should go the legal route or not. And typically we've been, we haven't done too much of that, to be honest. And particularly when you've got loans, very, very small size, you know, 300, 400 pound loan, the cost of going to court would far outweigh that. Now, some, that's not to say we wouldn't, because sometimes it's important to make a stand so that, you know, you don't get sort of... Um, people taking advantage, if you like, um, and the word getting around, oh, they'll, they'll just let you off. So, you know, we, we do consider that, but we haven't been that aggressive on, um, on pursuing people through the courts because it's in, in certain of our businesses, it's just not worth doing. Um, in terms of how much time we spend on it, I mean, the way, the way, the way that um, our businesses are organised is that the people who are writing the loans, they're responsible for collecting it. So it's quite self-selecting so for take our home credit business for example the agent is in the home and he's wondering whether you know well if i write this loan then you know I'm, my manager is going to be really pleased with me because i've written that loan and i've met my target for this month but equally they will be responsible for collecting that loan and they only get paid when they collect so they get a commission on their collections so if they write a bad loan <laughs> that's not going to collect they don't get paid so there's a real incentive there. In our branch-based lending business, similarly, we have targets for hitting volumes. But if um, a customer borrows and then three weeks down the road, their first payment bounces, the direct debit doesn't work, the branch is, on the f is responsible for getting on the phone, getting hold of the customer, saying, what's happened? Has something gone wrong? They are responsible for collecting. So there's a real incentive to lend well and to collect well. So, I mean, what proportion of your loans are bad debt? So it, it varies um, depending upon which business we look at because, the, as you saw from the customer types, they're very different. So if you think of it in terms of as a proportion of the, the value of the loans issued, in, um, in branch-based lending, it's around 10%. In guarantor loans, it's around 6 or 7%. And in home credit, of course, it's much higher because, A, they're very short-term loans and they're much smaller, but it's probably close between 40 and 50%. So people say to me, well, why, why, don't, you just, why don't you just lend to the good people? <laughs> the trouble is, in, in order to find the good people, I need to lend to everybody. Yes, just behind you. Uh, you've grown the, the branch-based lending business fairly aggressively. Is that mainly in the form of market share gains or lending to people who were previously not borrowers? So if we look at in, in branch-based lending, I mean, we are very, very discerning about who we lend to. If I tell you that last year we had 1.6 million applications and we lent to around 30,000 people. So for every 100 that come through the door, we're lending to about three. So very, very selective um, in terms of you know, really, really digging into the credit. Now, a lot of those applications will be duplicates, or they don't meet our credit criteria. 
And the other thing that we do that really differentiates us from a lot of the online competitors is we meet the customer. And our philosophy on it is when you're lending directly to somebody in this space, something that's gone wrong in their past, you need to find out what it was. And so when lending direct, in other words, when there's no guarantor present, you need to meet them. Now, whether that's in a home credit business where the agent gets to know the customer, goes up, to, up the garden path every week for 30, 40, 50 weeks, they know that customer incredibly well. They know what's going on. Similarly, in branch-based lending, we'll take the application online, we'll look at it, we'll score it. Yep, in principle, we're happy to do that. We then get them on the phone and then say, please come into the branch, and you're going to sit down with one of our managers for 45 minutes. And we're going to talk to you. We're going to find out what's happened in your life. Why are you coming to us? Let's go through your finances. Let's really understand why you need this loan. Is this loan going to help you? Is it going to solve your problem? Because if it isn't, we don't want to write the loan because it's likely it's going to go wrong. You can only get that when you meet someone face to face. A lot of the online competitors in branch-based lending, so likely loans, 118, 118 money, you've seen advertised on television, they're all losing money. And the reason they lose money is because their operating costs are very low because they're just it's an online journey. They've got just someone, some people in a call center perhaps or dealing purely online. We've got 73 branches. We've got 400 people out in branches, really expensive people, you know, branch managers earning £60,000 a year because they know they can dig into that credit and discern which people are the right people to lend to. And it's why our, um, our rates of delinquency, I said I mentioned 10%, that's incredibly low for a business like this. If you look at the online lenders, some of our competitors are at 50%. That's why we make money, they don't make money. And there's no one else doing it. Yeah. Don't quite get this guarantor loan thing. I mean, maybe I'm a cynic, but Cynic is good. I'm looking here that your interest rate's up to 80%. Yep. So if somebody asks me to guarantee a loan of 80% and I'm credit worthy, yep. why don't I borrow from a bank at 4% so and then lend I, them I, the money? I get asked that question. I got that I get, No, no I, get, no, I get asked that question a lot. So first and foremost, the, the thing to realise is that the guarantors that are often acting for you know, this customer who is, or this applicant who is deeply subprime is not necessarily a prime borrower. So they might be equally subprime. Um, why don't, even if they were a prime borrower, why wouldn't they get the money and lend it to them? Well, because they don't want to, if they're uncle or aunt, even father, you don't want to be responsible for taking it on. Um, secondly, if they borrow the money, young Johnny, doesn't, get, doesn't improve his credit history. He has no credit file at the Bureau. So, so actually, whilst, yes, helping a short-term need, he's still, he or she, at some point, is going to have to get on the, try and get on the credit ladder. If they do it on their own, if they come to someone like a 118, 118 money or an everyday loans and want to borrow, they've got no credit history, then the, uh, the lender will want to charge them a high-risk APR, probably much more than under the guarantor loans. You've got to remember that the guarantor rate that you saw there, and certainly at the lower end, it's lower than a credit union. Credit union is 42.6% APR. So when people talk about guarantor loans being high cost, it's not high cost, it's mid cost. It's the same as a credit union. In fact, some of our products are below that. So this is about... The guarantor wouldn't be going for credit No, but, the, but, but, but again, it's back to... if if. If, if you think, you know, and a lot of families do provide credit to their other family members, um, but, you know, that, that runs out at some point. That runs out at some point, and it doesn't help the individual build a credit history. So this is all about getting a young person onto the credit ladder, their first loan at a much lower cost than if they were borrowing on their own. And we see it with, you know, lots of our customers, they, they borrow from us relatively small amounts, they maybe top up a bit later, and then they repay with a loan from NatWest. So that we get a, a check saying, thanks very much, we want to pay off the loan, and it's a loan from NatWest. So that person has gone from being a subprime customer and is now able to borrow prime. That's the product working. Now, we're happy about that because there are plenty of other new customers coming, on, coming out of university, coming out of college, young person, first job, got no credit history, needs to borrow. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one last question? Can I, uh, um, 
Can I ask a question about the FCA uh, and you know, the regulators, both a, a barrier to entry to you and, a, and, a, and uh, somebody you have to deal with. What's the um, state of play with your businesses there? We've seen the FCA look at things like the um, yeah. pawnbrokers recently. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. So the FCA took control of consumer credit in April 2014. And it's fair to say before that, um, it was managed by the OFT. And I think no one would be ashamed to say that it was a relatively light touch. The FCA is a completely different animal. And I think quite rightly, they have seriously raised the standards seriously raised the standards and in fact it was one of the reasons we set up NSF in the first place was because we felt that this transition to FCA a lot of the companies the operators were not going to make it we're not going to make it and we're starting to see that because the challenges of meeting all the regulatory requirements are are difficult and you're right Keith they they are a major barrier to entry in terms of where we're at now because you know, the FCA has been at this a while. We had a major high cost credit review, so they did a really deep dive on all areas of our business, so in particular in home credit. And what we saw as the outcome of that was actually they had a really good look at it. And we spent lots of time with the FCA, lots of data, lots of meetings. They really understand what we're doing and importantly, what we're not doing. This is an important service because for many, Many people at this end of the spectrum, there are few sources of, of, of credit. There are few sources of credit because they don't, they don't have the infrastructure to be able to meet the customers, to really understand their needs, and to be able to collect the money back. So what we saw was some small changes to the operating, operating um, models of, of, our company, of companies in the space, but nothing material. So we feel we're in a good place in home credit, in branch-based lending, they're very comfortable with that product. We, you know, we haven't seen any issues. They love the fact that we meet the customer face to face. You know, a lot of the issues that they've been up against is, have you done affordability properly? Have you understood your customers' needs properly? We meet all of our customers. So in branch-based lending, we're in a good place. And then thirdly, um, guarantor loans has grown very quickly. It's now a billion pound market um, from you know, having started you know, around a decade ago. Um, at zero and so they have had a good look at that and all of the dialogue we've had with um, with the FCA about that is that again we think there may be some small operational tweaks but we're not expecting any sort of policy pronouncements and indeed I was sitting with um, the head of policy at the FCA two weeks ago and they said well because we asked them where are you on guarantor loans and they said we're, it's not our issue, it's to do with supervision. So that tells us that this is something which is just looking at processes, procedures, but not expecting anything uh, coming at us uh, down the pipe from the SCA. So we feel we're in a good place. Yes, please. Thanks so much for the uh, the presentation. Um, I just got the, um, the the score sheets in front of me, and I was um, uh, one of the questions is. Was it clear how and when shareholders would see a return? And I just wonder whether you might comment uh, on that a bit more. Well, we're paying dividends now. Um, and that was an ambition that um, my chief executive set very early on, that we would pay dividends. It's fair to say we have, we have invested substantial sums in growing the businesses, as I said, very, very aggressively. We've more than doubled the branch-based lending business. We've more than doubled the guarantor loans yeah. business and we've grown the home credit business by 40%. And that, that home credit um, uh, growth, of course, in a really mature market, and was we capitalised on what was going on at Provident Financial, which, you know, having taken 500-odd people from them, we decided we'd try and buy the business, and unfortunately we, we, weren't, we weren't successful in that endeavour. Um, but so we have invested very heavily in building from nothing, from nothing, a loan book of 336 million. And generating, and you know, don't take my numbers, but you know, Mark's numbers, you know, 40 to 50 million of EBIT, um, you know, from nothing. So, we now need to prove the model. So I agree with you. We need to get that return on asset up to 20 percent. We're probably about there in home credit. We're not there yet in branch-based lending and guarantor loans because we've been growing so quickly. But we can get there. So uh, just a couple of notices before we break up. So a reminder that in your packs you've got a uh, feedback survey. We'd love you to complete that. Either leave that on your seat or give it to one of our people on the way out. 
Uh, for those who are professional investors, you can apply for a certificate from us for three and a half hours of CPD time that's uh, accredited. Uh, this is our last forum of uh, 2019, but in the next couple of days you'll be getting copies of our note electronically and copies of the company's presentations. Uh, and uh, companies will now be available for you to uh, meet and talk uh, over drinks and canapes in the adjoining room. Thank you for attending.